said, the glory of God is here. Man, that's all I want to be is where he's at. But guess what? He never leaves me, so he's always with me. So wherever I am, he's there. Glory to God. Praise God. Well, today we can't go backwards to go forwards, but we introduced a, a new series that we'll be doing over the next several weeks entitled Grow. And so today I want to give the conclusion to the introduction. And so you're welcome to go back if you weren't here on last week. Go back. The notes are on our website. Uh, you can get all of the information. They should still be on the Uversion Bible app as well. But today I want to go to the conclusion of that introduction. I want to kind of give you all some insight into the character of God in terms of who he is. God never gives warning without instruction. Do you all agree with that? But here's the other side. He never gives instruction without incentive. And that's a good parenting tip. Never warn your children or threaten them without giving instruction. Right? But then don't give them instruction and show them the incentives on the other side of the instruction, the benefits if they do what you're instructing them to do. And so today, that's what we're going to look at, really, I believe, is the, the benefits of, of growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ. God didn't call you to stay the same. You should be better this Sunday than you were last Sunday. Right? God has called us to produce and be productive and to increase. And so today we're going to look at five reasons in our conclusion why we should give all diligence to grow in this knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the first one inspires me right out of the gate. We sung a little bit about it today. Again, the grace of God is the glory of God. And so number one, grace and peace are multiplied to you. That word multiplied there means increase. How many of you know you can have more grace in your life? How many of y'all are experiencing goodness right now? Raise your hand if, if you're experiencing goodness. God has more for you. How many of y'all have peace in your life right now? How many of you know there's more peace? It can get better, right? We, don't, we should never desire to stay the same. So grace and peace, they're multiplied to you. Grace and peace are multiplied to you. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. He says, grace and peace are multiplied to you. But he didn't stop there, did he? Right? So it's not automatic, right? It's not automatic that this is going to happen. He says, grace and peace are multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace are multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So we learn about God in the Old Testament. Right? We learn about Jesus in the New Testament, right? So if I want to build a better relationship with God, then I need to study the Old Testament to understand who he is. If I want to build a better relationship with Jesus, then I need to study the New Testament, right? And he said, grace and peace can be multiplied to me as I grow in my knowledge of God and his son, Jesus Christ, which requires effort on my part. How many know you're not growing sitting in this service? You don't grow until you leave the service and take the information home and study it for yourself. And then you still haven't grown until you make the decision to apply it to your life. All right? So he says, grace and peace are multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace are common forms of greetings in the New Testament. And so when, when they're saying grace and peace are... This is how they would introduce themselves. This is how they would come into the presence of another person. They say grace and peace to you. And what they were doing was pronouncing a blessing upon them. Grace here is a Greek word, uh, charis, and it means a greeting which requests God's unmerited favor upon the person being addressed. So every time you say grace to someone, what you're saying is I'm desiring that God's unmerited favor just live on you. Isn't that good? That means everywhere you go, good things happen to you. And even when the devil tries to throw a bad thing in there, God turns it around and brings some good out of it. So he can't win no matter how he tries. So it means joy. It means liberality. It means pleasure. It means gift, and it means benefit. The word peace here is a Greek word, irony, and it means a greeting requesting the natural results of God's favor, which is wholeness, quietness, rest, 
prosperity and to be set at one again. So if I have God's grace in my life, it should manifest through peace in my life where my life is whole, it's quiet, I'm resting, there's prosperity, and everything in my life has been made to work the way God designed for it to work. Folks, that's how God called us to live. Do you believe that? And, and so I want to say that to you this morning. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. I'm talking about every time you pull up at the grocery store, the spot at the front just opens up for you. Come on, they run out of everything that you came there to look for, and someone walks up to you and says, is there something I can help you with? Yeah, I noticed this. You all ran out of these items on the shelf. Let me go check in the back to see. You know what? We just got a whole new shit. Today is your day. I'm talking about we can live here, folks. We get the best deals on everything. It says this can be increased in your life as you improve in your relationship with God and Jesus Christ. So note that these two blessings are multiplied in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. So it's only in Christ, New Testament, that we can enjoy uh, the fullness of God's favor and the fullness of God's peace. Now, how many of y'all are married in here? How many of y'all are married? Raise your hand if you're married. Now, if you're going to enjoy the fullness of a marriage, you've got to grow in that relationship. If you understand a female, there's no way I can not talk to my wife all day long then come home tonight pulling on her. What is her reaction, ladies? Get off. No. No. You haven't said nothing to me all day long. Watch this. Now you want the fullness of everything that I have to offer? Not happening. If it does happen, it's not really happening. Somebody out there know what I'm talking about. You the only one that's happening for it. It's not really happening for you. Come on, ladies, don't leave me out here by myself. You can't get the fullness of that without growing in that relationship. So I want you to think about it. We want all the benefits from God, but we don't want to grow in our relationship with God. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, and let's look at verse 3. It's only in Christ that we can enjoy the fullness fullness of God's favor and peace. So I'm not chasing after favor. I'm not writing a million confessions about the favor of God and the peace of God. Man, I'm chasing after Christ. How many of all his favor comes on me as a result of that? Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, past tense, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. But where is it at? in Christ. Is it in church? Where is it at? It's in Christ. So if you desire God's grace and peace to be multiplied in your life, it's through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now we looked at that word knowledge last week and it's epignosis. It's a full discernment. It's exact knowledge of who Christ is. So on one hand, I can't be saying, Lord, if it's your will, heal me. I don't know who he is. Right? I get sick and I say, God put this on me to teach me a lesson. I don't know him. Because he doesn't use evil to teach us anything. Come on now, don't leave me out here by myself. So I've got to know him for who he is and not what other people have told me he is. I've got to have a personal discernment and acknowledgement of who Jesus. I can't sit around and say that, that I lost my car because it was the will of God. How can that be the will of God to get your car repossessed? And he promised you he'd supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. You see how we do this and we, we project all of this on him. And believe it or not, when we say this around unbelievers, we don't understand the way they're listening is why would they want to serve a God that's going to teach me something that way? Right? 
and let's just bring it right home. You know, we, we sleep with people that we're not married to, and we say he understands. How can he understand and say that he hates evil at the same time? See, so when you know him, then you begin to see things the way he sees them. Watch this. And then you adjust your life accordingly. So as you grow in your relationship with him, the natural result is that you should be more like him. So when you're trying to measure your growth in God or in Christ, your life should start to look like he looks. And you know you're growing because now you're reacting, responding, thinking, doing the way he would do things. That's why sometimes I struggle with the whole what would Jesus do, the whole movement. Sometimes I struggle with it because what would Jesus do doesn't require you to know much of what he might do. It's all left to your interpretation. But if you change that to what did Jesus do, then that requires me to go look at that. See, so a lot of people were walking around wearing that, but that was a cliche. Right, because they may misinterpret that. They may slap somebody and then say, well, Jesus went in the, the synagogue and overturned the, the money changers. See, how, that's what people do, right? Right? They may be at a party drinking wine, getting drunk, and say, well, well what was the first miracle that Jesus did? <laughs> what would Jesus do? He going to keep the party going and turn the water into wine, go back out there and get some more to drink. We ran out. See how people will do that. Right? So I want you to listen to me. I don't want you to know Jesus because of who I told you he is. Know him for yourself. And then you'll see him for yourself. Then when you see him for yourself, no one can take that away from you. Number two. Now it's going to take faith to receive this one. He has provided all things pertaining to life and godliness. Did you all hear that? He has provided all things that pertain unto life and godliness. The moment you accepted Jesus, everything had already been provided for you. And he did it 2,000 years before you were ever born. Okay, watch this. He has provided all things that pertain to to life and godliness. So I want you to note that God provides all things pertaining to life and godliness, but again, it's through the epic gnosis of him who has called us to glory and virtue. You know, the only reason someone would hold on to their money and every time an offering comes, they get scared like they're getting ready to lose something because they don't know God. It's the only reason someone would do that is nothing more than fear of what I'm getting ready to give won't come back to me. That doesn't come from a nothing, but I don't know God. I don't have a relationship with God in this area. See how quiet it got just bringing that up? All right. So now, God has provided all things. Let's read that, verse 3, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. As his divine power, his ability, we'll talk about that in a moment, has given to us all things, has given is that past, future, or present tense. So I want you to understand something. Then in the mind of God, a lot of stuff that we're asking him for, he believes he's already given us. So then it becomes an insult for my children to ask me to feed them, and it's a refrigerator full of food in there. It's an insult for them to come to me and say, Daddy, can I have breakfast today? Can I, can I make a bowl of cereal, Daddy? Daddy, will you bless me with a bowl of cereal? Son, I've already blessed you. Go in there and, and fix a bowl of cereal and enjoy it. Watch this. So when the relationship is right, I don't even ask for things that I believe have already been provided for me. Y'all don't want this this morning. Y'all don't want this this morning. The fact that I have to ask is an indication of the level of relationship that I have. I'm 
getting ready to go home because I don't know if we're ready for this today. I told you my ministry just started on last week. You know where fear comes from? A lack of relationship. Scripture says perfect love casts out all fear. The word perfect there means developed. When you know how much God loves you, last thing I'm concerned about is whether or not I'm eating. Or my bills are going to be paid. Or a roof is going to be over my head. Come on, if he did that for birds, come on. I need three good amens in this place. Now your best hallelujah that you have. He's already provided all things, and I'm going to work with this, according to his power. So you know where your fear comes from? You're trusting in your ability. You're looking at your limitations. You're looking at what you have, what you can do. You're not looking at what he already did. All right, so the word power is a Greek word dunamis. It's where we get our English word dynamite. It's explosive. It's powerful. It's a force. God has miraculous power. He can do miracles. He has all the ability that you will ever need, and he has an abundance of it. And the scripture says the most difficult thing he ever did was raising Jesus from the grave, and all he did was flinch his arm to do that, and he can't pay your bills. He can't bring a spouse into your life, so you got to go try to do it yourself. Good stuff, isn't it? How many of y'all glad you came today? All right, and so watch this. And so, so we got stuck in a dispensation that the Spirit of God has moved on from. Old Testament, the book of Acts, the New Testament. We're living in the New Testament, which is the dispensation of grace. Watch this. So you're looking for a move of God. He already moved. <laughs> what is he waiting on? You to respond to what he already did. See, my giving is a response to knowing that all my needs have already been provided for. I don't eat healthy out of fear. I eat healthy out of the 120 years he's promised me. See, that's my faith responding to what I believe he's provided for me. I don't give God a raise every year financially because I'm a, no, that I'm responding to, to he, he's going to meet more of my needs in 2018. Watch this, folks. Whether you give towards vision forward or not, that's why we don't put no pressure on you. It's already paid for. See, and the ones who have a revelation of that, they know taking care of God's house just further takes care of my house. See, what I'm simply doing is sowing into my kids' future. You all want a little bit more of this today? Come on, don't pray for God to meet your needs. Thank God that your needs are already met. Don't go to him talking about it. Show me, Lord. Give me a sign. What? He gave you his word. Why do you need a sign? That's Old Testament. And so what church got reduced to was everybody wanting to see a move of God. But watch this. The spirit moved, but nobody's life really changed long term. You know why? Because nobody was growing. They were coming to church waiting to see something. Old Testament. Show us a sign. Two good hallelujahs. Say, I am healed. Say, I am whole. Say, I'm supernaturally debt free. My debts are being canceled as I speak. God's given me the wisdom to pay off everything I owe early because his grace, which is his goodness, 
lives on me every day of my life. I have the peace of God. I walk in quietness. I walk in rest. I walk in assuredness. My life is made whole now. Come on, I just need 10 people to really believe that. Come on, I need 10 people to stop having church and just declare that I'm going to be the church. I'm not going to be broke again. I'm not going to be sick again. I am going to be what God made me to be. Now watch this. If you're trying to become that, you'll never get there. Until you accept what he made you, you can't walk in this. And in his mind, not yours, he's already provided everything that you'll ever need. Life there is zoe. See, the God kind of life. In this context, he's referring to our overall well-being. Or we can say it this way. The life he intended us to live. How many parents are in here? You want to see your children struggling? Come on. Do you want to see them busted up? Do you want to see them losing? I don't know a good parent that did not think about providing a good life for their children in advance of having the children. And even if they had the children without preparing, once they know they're coming, they start getting ready. Right? And as parents, we say these things. They didn't choose to be here. We brought them here. So we have a responsibility to provide everything that they'll need to be successful in this life. Why would God be any different if my carnal, fleshly nature that, that misses it and makes it, from t and I'm all over the map from time to time, and, and he's a perfect, loving God. If I can think that way, how much more is he thinking that way about you? You're on God's mind. He wakes up every day thinking about how to get to you what you need. Matter of fact, he never even went to sleep. I even said that wrong. He was up while you were asleep putting stuff together. If you know that and if you're aware of it, you wake up with that awareness that the day has already been mapped out for you. So then godliness here is referring to a pious conduct that comes out of a devotion to God. And so if I understand God's already provided everything that pertains to life and godliness, he did this according to his ability, then my conduct should line up with that. See, this is where we, this is where we drop off sometimes. Right? We write all the confessions, but we drop off when it comes to matching our conduct with what we believe. See, no amens right there, no, nothing like when he provided everything for you, nothing like that. But the real excitement is your life looking like his. The real excitement is not your beautiful house, the real excitement is you stop cussing. I'd be way more excited about me stop lying and sleeping with people that I'm not married to. Come on, somebody. Stop stealing from God. I'd be way more excited about that than the car I'm going to go get in and drive home today. Because if I really believe then he's done all of this for me, then why wouldn't my life and my conduct line up with what I believe? Why do I make excuses for that? Why do I justify that? See, a loser will always tell you why they lost. Just sit around and listen for a minute. I lost because a winner is just simply going to find a way to win. Winner never loses. A winner just learns lessons and they get better and they improve. Come on, somebody. They don't waddle in the mud. They say, okay, it happened. Let's address it. Let's deal with it. How can we get better? Glory to God. And then they get better and the getting better becomes the victory over the loss that they encounter. The conduct is important, folks. People don't want to come to church today because we look like them. We talk like Christ, but we live like them. And they can see that. Let's talk about three super benefits that I believe come out of this. They're all found in, in first, verse 4. And if this doesn't get you 
going. If this doesn't light your candle, then I don't know what can. There, there are three super benefits that just come out of knowing that he's provided all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's why I call them super benefits. All of us get benefits on the job, but then when you've been there for a while, you get super benefits. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? Look at verse 4. He says, by which have been given to us, past tense, exceeding great and precious promises, that through these, the promises, you might be partakers of his divine nature. And we'll talk about that for a moment. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What's the first super benefit? That he's given you exceedingly great and precious promises. In the New Testament alone, folks, there are 750 promises. 250 of them are unique, which means they're not repeaters. The 750, sometimes you can find in multiple books. They're saying the same promise in a different book. 250 of them are unique promises to your life. Now, it's one thing if I promised you something. It's something completely different if God promised you something. God said, I am not a man that I can lie or the son of man that I should repent. If I said it, shall I not do it? 250 promises. One of them is that you can pray for one another and be healed. Another one is that he'll supply all your needs. Watch this, according to his riches and glory. But if we don't know that, our conduct doesn't match that. And I know people, listen to me, this is why I'm getting ready to fight against this fear. I know people that can preach you, preach you under a chair and quote scriptures under a chair on God meeting your needs. And you look at their giving record by the end of the year. See, I'm learning a lot about you. Not for the sake of knowing, it's helping me be a better pastor. That don't listen to what people say. Watch what they do. Ladies, you should have wrote that down. Single ladies in particular. Because they can tip, boy, they can, boy, they can, boy, they can word that, put all that together, wrap that up, boy. And you'd like, I never had nobody talk to me like that before. Because that's all it was, was talk. Pay attention to behavior. Somebody tell you they got great revelation on grace, see their willingness to give. You can't have a great revelation about grace and be stingy at the same time. Because the grace of God is all about giving. God so loved. Second super benefit, since you all got so excited about that. This enables us to be partakers of his divine nature. Nature there is a Greek word, phusis, spelled P-H-U-S-I-S. It means growth by germination or expansion. It means natural production. So the more you take on his nature, the more you naturally produce. Your life naturally becomes more productive because you're taking on more of the nature of Christ. So if you think about it, when Christ needed his taxes paid, did he go have a 24-hour prayer meeting? Did he? What did he do? He just said there's a fish at the bottom of the water. Cast your pole in, pull him up. Watch this. And there's enough in his mouth to pay for your taxes and mine. See, y'all, I knew. More of his nature you take on. You, you remember? I'm thinking about uh, Lazarus when he died. You, you remember when they, they wanted him to do something supernatural? What did he say? Father, the only reason I'm praying, the only reason I'm saying this out loud is for their benefit. Then he said, because I already know you heard me. because Jesus is the grace of God. And the more you take on his nature, the more productive you become. 
to imagine trying to be productive without his nature. See, we're trying to understand why things don't work. Because it's our nature leading the, the way. Look at this third super benefit, which is, to me, huge. It allows us to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. So his promises, see, see we notice, let's look at interpret scripture in context of all the scripture, right? It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. So he started out with his promises, didn't he? So he said, I want to bless you to motivate you to be more like me. Then when you become more like me, you naturally escape the corruption that is in this world. So in other words, I can't escape it if I'm not becoming more like him. Then when I see it still present in my life, it's not the female that's making me do this. It's my own nature. See, so if I want to be different, then I've got to allow more of his nature to, to take place in my life. You ever heard people say, see, it's not in my nature to cheat on my wife. It's not mine. It's not in his nature. So if I have his nature, then it's not in my nature. See, you missed that. Did you catch that? So not, if I remove that and, I, and I'm just relying on my nature, she's in trouble. Because we all know us. Some of the thoughts go through our head. If I acted on just five of those, not 25,000 that went through my head, I'm getting ready to tear some stuff up, right? Stuff come through our head every day, right? Right? Why are you pastoring that church? You need to be out. You, you don't even know what you're missing out there. You need to go back out there to see what it's like. All kind of stuff go through your head. You ever just had this thought, if I could just be a heathen for one weekend? <laughs> Am I the only one? I just want to be unsaved for 48 hours. I'm the only one that ever had that thought. Anyone in here else willing to be honest? I'm talking about just one of them Fridays. You didn't get your full prayer time in that morning. Right? You, you didn't get it all in, and you just said, you know what, 48 hours. to be the old me. Anybody else in here willing to be honest? I'm talking about just let me just cuss somebody out. I want to get in a fight, or just a good old-fashioned fight. I just want to go to the club tonight and just... Come on, am I, am I the only one? Am I the only one? But what will naturally happen if you have his nature, it'll bring those thoughts into captivity. So you can be saved all the time. So I call those super benefits right there, man. I get, I get 750 promises. Come on, somebody. I take on more of his nature, which consistently allows me to escape the corruption that's in the world. See, at the end of the day, isn't the ultimate objective for being a Christian, listen to this, isn't the ultimate objective to be more like Christ? See, or is the ultimate objective to get a bigger house, more clothes, hello somebody, all the stuff that's perverted in preaching. Listen, you, you're never going to hear that here. It's never going to be about cars, clothes, and money that measure my spirituality. You're not going to hear that. H how much does your life look like Christ? Whole lot of people driving Bentleys living like the devil. I'm not speaking against Bentleys. All I'm saying is don't measure who you are by the Bentley. Measure who you are by how much does your life look like Christ. Romans chapter 8, look at verse 28 through 30. See, the ultimate objective, that's why we're called Christians, right? To be Christ-like. 
to be a devoted follower of Christ, right? To be a disciple of Christ. That's why we're called Christians. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. And we know, that's inside knowledge, that all things work together for good to those who love God. Does anybody in here love God? Well, I'm telling you, whatever you're going through right now, if you know how much God loves you and you know how much you love God, it's working as I'm speaking right now. It's working out for your good. Whether you can see it, whether you understand it, it doesn't matter. The end result will be you will win. God will get the glory and Satan is already defeated. And somebody who is in a tight spot right now needs to give God glory in advance of you walking in the fullness of that. We know this. See, we don't get all worried and anxious and pulling our hair out and, 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 and all uptight. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Watch this now. Who are called according to his purposes. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be what? To, to live in a big house and drive fancy cars? No, he predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son. That should be the first order of business. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate or predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Come on for your glory. Come on, somebody. See, if he declared you righteous, you don't think he wants your life to look glorious? Because you represent him. We all understand this. You know, my wife, my daughter, they already know when they get up and they get ready to leave out of that house. I'm like, wait, no. Fix all that up. Can't just go out of this house. No different do they, than they, they want me just going out of the house. Because we all represent each other. Listen, he ain't going to go through all of that and not make sure all of this is right for you. My admin is laughing over there cause, because she came in early this morning. She's getting herself together in the office. So I walked in. As soon as I saw her, I said, you okay? <laughs> she said, what are you talking about? <laughs> she said, just give me a minute. I'm getting ready. Because my thinking is, don't go out there. <laughs> Watch it on your cell phone back here. Because <laughs> everybody know. Come on, y'all know I'm preaching better than you saying amen. Am I right or wrong? So I want you to think about that. God is the exact same way. He's not going to do all of that and then not glorify your life. Now, you only deal with people like that when you have a relationship with them. I mean, I can't just say that to anybody. Right? So other people, I just got to walk by and say, well... I got to talk to God about this. There are others, there's enough relationship, I can just talk directly to them. They can talk directly to me. Go to Philippians chapter 3. You all getting anything out of this this morning? Philippians chapter 3. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Philippians chapter 3. But what things were gained to me, Paul just got done talking about all of his life accomplishments. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrew. All of his uh, accolades academically. And I'm a Pharisee. I know the law frontwards and backwards. He just got done celebrating all of his life accomplishments. And look at what he said here in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those have I counted loss for Christ. Why, Paul? Yet, indeed, I also count all these things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. So, in other words, they pale in comparison to the knowledge that I have and relationship that I have with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is uh, from God by faith. Watch this. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Come on, somebody. Which means I cannot know him if I don't go through things in life that help me become more like him. I can't say that I want to be like him, but I don't want to experience what he experienced. Folks, you're going to have ups in life. You're going to have downs in life. But be of good cheer. The one that you're serving overcame everything that you will ever face in this life. And if he overcame it, then you'll overcame coming too. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Come on, Christ, in you, the hope of glory. Why are we so downtrodden? Why are we? Listen, God is in you. And if God is in you, you've got everything that you need to be saved. Paul said, all of that stuff is, is garbage to me. Listen, I'll go through everything I've gone through 25 times over to come out more like Christ. Take this church from me. Strip us down to nothing again. Come on, somebody. If the end result is I'm going to come out more like Christ, give it to me. See, because the reality is I went through it, but I didn't lose nothing. So it wasn't about physical possessions. It wasn't about material stuff. It was about nature and being conformed, being broken down. All of us need to be broken. You know why Saul... I mean, David needed Saul in his life. David needed Saul in his life. You know why? So that God could kill the Saul that was in David. I'm telling you, I needed that man in my life. I won't say his name, but I needed him to kill the him that was in me. See, now I get to come out of it never ever wanted to make anybody feel the way I was made to feel. Come on, somebody. Now I get to identify with the sufferings that the people that God's called me to serve go through. And I don't look down on them because I've been there. I know what it's like to have nothing. I know what it's like. Come on, somebody. See, you're not going to conform without going through some things. Need it. Stop being so soft. Running every time a problem shows up. When you know God is with you, you don't run from problems. You run to problems. You say, okay, you want to show up? Then let's go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody in here feel like just back biting the back out of the front of the chair that's in front of you right now. So you start seeing your challenges differently. Somebody ought to praise God right now with no money in your pocket. Somebody ought to praise God right now. You're in the toughest situation you've ever been in your life. You ought to give God, you ought to put the devil on notice right now that he came knocking on the wrong door today. Glory to God. Stop all this wimpy stuff. Stop all this crying. Cry for a moment. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy, when you get up, joy has got to be there in the morning. I've got to wake up knowing that the Lord is on my side, and a thousand can fall in my right hand, ten thousand at my left hand, but it will not win over me and my family. you got to wake up with some joy in your heart. Glory to God. Paul said that I might know him. That's what this was all about. The fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Number three, this will help with spiritual amnesia. See, failure to grow indicates that we have forgotten that we were redeemed by the blood of Christ in the first place. 
Failure to grow means that. Look at verse 9, 2 Peter 1, 9. For he who lacks these things, the eight graces that we're talking about, is short-sighted. See, they only, in this context, they only make decisions that gratify them today. That's a short-sighted person. They're not thinking about the long-term consequences of these choices that I'm making today. And it eventually leads to blindness. And I'm just using this as an example. We go from sleeping with someone that we're not married to to living with someone we're not married to, and we stay right there. That's a person that's become blind. Short-sightedness was sleeping with somebody I wasn't married to. That's short-sighted. Yeah, because I'm just trying to gratify self. I'm not thinking about the long-term consequences of this. Right? The longer I stay in it, the more blind I become. It's no different than someone who's married who begins to start stepping outside. See, short-sighted is when I start stepping out. I eventually become blind and it becomes a lie. And I've forgotten that I was redeemed. read this in context, then that means my eternal salvation is in jeopardy. Because I was so short-sighted. See, and kids are short-sighted. Teenagers. Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child. But when I became a man, at some point we got to grow up think long term make eternal decisions hallelujah it's good stuff isn't it help you avoid spiritual amnesia then we'll never stumble Peter says if you do these things you will never stumble now we're going to talk about what that means that doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes but by the scripture it says you'll never stumble Therefore, brethren, be the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. How many of y'all want to know what you're called to do? I'm going to tell you your calling today. How many of y'all want to know what your calling is in life? See, I know you think it's to be a doctor, a lawyer. To, your calling is to grow in those eight graces. You, you do that, everything else will take care of itself. Did you catch that? He hadn't left the context. He says, be diligent to make your calling. This is your calling. And what I've chosen you to do, that's what election means, sure. For if you do these things, what things? Grow in those eight graces. Then you'll never stumble. Well, what, what does that mean? The word stumble in the Greek means to fall into misery, to become wretched. Watch this, to lose your salvation. According to Thayer's Bible Dictionary. Well, we know that's true because look at the very next verse. Look at verse 10, which is number 5. An abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom. An abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom. You see what came right after that? What's the key word there? Everlasting. What does everlasting speak to? Eternity. Right? So when he's saying if you do these things, you'll never stumble. You won't lose eternity in an everlasting why I don't teach once saved, always saved. I personally believe that's why people live however they want to live. And listen to me. I don't want a grace of God that teaches me that. If that's the grace of God that's going to make me feel comfortable with cheating and, and lying and stealing, come on somebody, and God's grace covers that, I don't want it. I don't want it. So if you're listening and you're going to see over the next several weeks, if it's the grace of God, we're going to grow in Christ and move further away from things that will cause us to lose our salvation. If it's pure grace teaching. Not that, don't worry about that, God, grace covers that. I don't want that grace. Verse 11, for so an interest will be supplied to you, how? Abundantly. Into the everlasting, key word there, kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
So then what is meant by the idea of an abundant entrance? You may be able to enter not having escaped from a shipwreck or on fire. So in other words, God doesn't want you to come in to heaven broken. I don't know about you, I don't want to just make it in. See, if it's an abundant interest, then it's a glorious interest, right? But as it were, in triumph. So the image and the picture that God has about our lives is that we've experienced so much victory down here that we take that victory into our glorious eternity. Hallelujah. And I'm so, I could almost see some of you all now. I don't know what you pledged while you were in college. I don't know what you did, but, but I could just see you just coming through there. I mean, just. <sighs> Paul, James, John. I mean, I, you, you all understand victory. I don't know what sorority, but I could just see you coming in there like, oh, God. Oh, it was so good on earth. It's even better now that I'm skiwi. I don't know what it is. That, I don't know what. I don't. Well, all I'm saying is, folks, we're supposed to have so much victory down here on earth that we take that victory and we go from glory to glory, triumph to triumph. Oh no, that's how I'm going in, folks. I'm not holding nothing back. I mean, I'm coming in like we just won a national championship. I'm coming in there. I mean, I'm jumping. I'm like, boom, boy, what's up, boy? I'm going, I'm, I mean, I'm chest bump. I'm Jesus. Boy, what's up, Jesus? What's up, Jesus? Paul, way to go, Paul. Man, that's my man, Paul. I'm coming in there like we just won a national championship. We in here. Somebody give God some glory in this place today. Come on, somebody give God some glory in this place today. Come on, come on, somebody give God some glory in this place today. Come on, we, we, we can't struggle forever on earth. We can't do it. No, we've got to get over on the winning side and learn how to stay on the winning side so that when we leave here, we just go from glory to glory, faith to faith, Victory to victory. Come on, somebody. Why? Because we serve a good God. Somebody shout in this place and give God glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, I'm going to ask them all to line up like I'm coming out the tunnel. I want Jesus. I want Paul. I want Peter. And I'm just coming up there like this. Bam, bam. I mean, I'm just coming through heaven like that. Celebrating. Because I know I took care of business on earth. I'm coming in there. See how he wants us to come in? A glorious entrance. A triumphant entrance. Not with one leg. <laughs> Let me on in, Lord. Let me on in. Definitely not scared. Wondering, can I come in? Or get in and just made it in. I got it right on my deathbed. All of this is just the introduction. I'm so excited about how we build from here. I don't know what to do. Let's lift our hands to the Father. If you're not standing on your feet, I'd ask that you do so. I think all of us would agree that everything that we just heard, it really requires a, a careful study of these eight graces that will allow us to grow. And I think all of us can say that it's worth the effort. If you've been saved 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years and you haven't seen your life move much from the time you gave your life to Christ, to where it's at right now, that's not on God. You'll notice in here, no way I'm getting ready to, you're going to see a complete paradigm. Shall we bust something up? So you nowhere in here do you see come to church for this to happen. So 
See, a lot of people can come to church for a lot of reasons. They can come to play. That don't mean they're going to sit down and look at the scriptures and learn. They came to play. I'm not saying that about them. They can come to sing. That doesn't mean they're going to go sit down and learn and try to grow and take the notes. So they can sing for years and life never changes. A usher can come to serve. That don't mean they're going to take that home. I've seen this for years, folks. And you're going to see none of this has anything to do with coming to church. It has everything to what you do when you leave church. Sunday is an ecclesia. It's when all of us who are called out come to, together to fellowship, to get more instruction, right? To go back out and win more people. We've kind of turned church into an event. I go to church. Never was intended that way. We're supposed to be the church. Watch this. Not within the four walls of this facility. See, so what church turned into was what it could do for the leadership. What church was always intended to be is what can the leadership do for the people. Listen to me. You don't exist for the church church exists for you right and if you can't give to a place and you don't see it being returned back to you in positive ways of growth and health and classes and schools and all these things you should be a head player the only people's lives you see growing are the first families and you understand how that's set up said God is good. Come on, I'm ready to be an end time New Testament grace church. Anybody ready to go with me? I don't want no more shows. I don't need another show. I need real. I need change. I need growth. I need I was broke, but now all my bills paid. I need my marriage was busted up, but now we're back in love with each other again. Come on, somebody. I'm just out of time, man. I'm so full of this message. I just got to let you go today. Everyone in here knows where you're at with God. Everyone in here does. You don't really need all of the stuff that I'm getting ready to do because you already know where you're at. So if you're in here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, man, listen, I just... Something was just presented to you today that I don't know how you could pass that up. Especially in times that we're living in right now. Pray for this leader of this country. Pray for him every day. Because it's his divisive nature and spirit that's getting into this country right now. Pray against that. 